Hi, and welcome to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast for athletes, coaches, and professionals who want to achieve their goals faster. I'm David Charlton, and I'll be sharing proven methods from leading athletes, coaches, and experts that will help you get the most from your talent. Today's show is sponsored by Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosford, near Newcastle upon Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Hi everyone, welcome back. And today I had a really enlightening conversation with a talented sports psychologist who's worked for a number of years now. In a variety of football club academies and also having worked and currently working in a football club academy and someone who supported a number of young footballers this topic is something I'm really passionate about the development of young footballers young athletes and so in today's episode we're going to be talking about typical challenges that young footballers face we'll talk about the various different age groups and how the challenges change over time. And we'll talk about what our guest James considers the most difficult and challenging years for a youngster and how as sports psychologists we can help in the football academy setting when we're working with players, supporting parents and upskilling coaches. Enjoy. Hi, James. I know over the last few years or so, you've you've had well, you've had quite a lot of experiences in academy football. So, would you like to tell the listeners about what you see are the typical challenges for young academy footballers? Yeah, definitely. I think I think academy football, um, as you know, I think you've you've worked within it as well, and with some some players within academy football, and I think it brings it that there's so many challenges um, that, that come about, and so many typical challenges. I think throughout my time within academy football I've worked and supported children from from the age of eight years old to teenagers of 15 16 up to the age of you know 20 young adults going into to 20 and above so you know it's a broad range broad age range that, that includes many many different challenges at you know at different points in time and I think you could you could look at maybe the generic and typical challenges that that all will probably experience and you know that can range from you know, pressure of performing at the weekend because you're coming up to, to a period where the decisions are being made potentially regarding contracts. It might be your local rivals. You might have parents who might be putting unindated pressure on you, etc. And But it also might be the challenges of overcoming injuries that, that many, many footballers experience during their academy journey. Um, being deselected and, and just, I guess, probably just the daily challenge of trying to, you know, develop your craft as a footballer. That's challenging enough for many. And I think you could probably break it down into age groups in terms of some of the typical challenges that you might kind of see within within academy football. So uh, I'm sure many of your listeners know about academy football, but but for those that don't, it's breaking down into s- different phases. So if we look at the foundation phase, for example, which is under nines to under twelves, that's when players first come into academy football from from grassroots, and that challenge for them would probably be well at grassroots, they're the star player. You know, they've played every minute of every game, um, but but now they're in an environment where, you know, at times that that isn't going to be the case, and and that can be really hard for an eight or nine year old child to try and comprehend and, and rationalise and understand. So we know that you know the thinking part of the brain doesn't get developed, and therefore helping and supporting and educating, you know, not just players. But, but also parents through that stage, you know, is critical. And I guess as you move through the ages, within those ages, you look at under 11s, there's also the challenges of, you know, that's the age where they're moving from primary school to secondary school. Um, so, you know, they've got different challenges going out, on outside of football as well. You know, they're making new friends, they're, they're trying to settle into new environments. Um, you know, they're going through, they're moving from, as we well know, moving from, from childhood into to early adolescence where, you know, they'll start going through puberty, growth related challenges, all sorts of things that I think sometimes when you look at it from the outside, you don't really kind of comprehend and you don't really realise. So you can look at growth related stuff. You've got one child who's moving freely and, you know, very agile, quick one week and two or three weeks down the line might have had a sudden growth spurt and, and, and suddenly it's like Bambi on ice. And for them, it's really difficult to understand. It can be a challenge in itself. And I guess then you move through the ages. We, we talked about it just as we were starting up here about, you know, that youth development phase where, where kids, you know, that's from the age of 13s to under 16s. And 
you know, the challenges, you know, there's challenges with football as we've, we've talked about, but again, there's school, there's, there's relationships with peers, there's, you know, there's girlfriends and boyfriends that might become, come on the line and might become apparent. And then you're also trying to become independent as, as, a, as a young adult and a, um, you know, you try and move away from your parents and all that can be a real challenge. And, and then you get to the under 16 age group where, you know, you can be offered a scholarship. So that two year scholarship or, or, or you might be released from an academy. And I think for experience, that that transition that that move from under 16 to 18 alongside the first year of that scholarship is, is probably one of the most challenging what is one of the most challenging experiences that if, if, if a child or was to get that far that the academy footballers can experience that's fascinating can we i suppose rewind a little bit then and consider the the various different age groups there you've you talked about the nines to the twelves uh, i suppose yeah, how do you best support these these players, is it through one-to-one work? Is it workshops? Is it more so with the parents and coaches? How does it generally work? Yeah, probably probably the latter. I think many, I think we've all had the experience of sports psychs, maybe early sports psychs of, we feel like we should be helping everybody. So we try to do one-to-ones with with everybody we can, who comes in, who we, who we come into contact with and, and seeks our support. But actually when it comes to working with nine, 10 year olds, 11 year olds, I find it that actually probably the better work's probably done through parents and coaches. Um, so that's trying to understand what's going on within, within that child's life at that particular moment in time and getting the perspectives of everyone that you possibly can do. Um, at Sunderland as well, we also did provide, um, group workshops for, for, for those of, of nine to 12 and some do and some don't agree with it. I do because I made it part of my philosophy around working, putting sessions like that on for the younger age which was all about fun. It's all about making sports psychology fun and engaging and something that they really want to look at developing and learning. So by all means, we weren't looking at um, I don't know, inverted youth theory or theories of arousal within those age groups. But what we were doing was making it applicable to their age, making it fun and engaging, using, using games to try and bring those kind of concepts to life. Just to not necessarily give them the basic skills, but just to give them a basic understanding of what it is that's important um, in terms of those psychological characteristics. So, yeah more so working through parents and coaches but but those young age groups at Sunderland specifically there was there was group workshops that as I mentioned we tried to make as fun and as enjoyable as possible yeah and surely at that young age and even through from the the next age group the 13 to 16 fun's got to be the key thing if you're going to engage with them definitely definitely and I, I remember I've got a vivid kind of memory of my first week or my first couple of weeks at Sunderland I remember because we used to do this thing called day release, which is where all the kids come in for kids of different ages come in for the whole day and they'll do a variety of different activities. It might be uh, they'll have their coaching, their football coaching, obviously. They might do a little bit of education. Um, they might do a little bit of gym work. And then there's also psychology that was involved in that as well. And I remember the first couple of weeks I went in and they were like, all right, you got psychology with James now. The faces were dry, like it was like the worst thing ever. Like, oh, really? And then I realised that right, this is something I've got to try and grab it and try and change this kind of thought process around what sports psychology is and, and and the importance of it. But and then you fast forward three years, and I remember going down into the into the barn at Sunderland and you know getting ready to take them up to the to the classroom or doing some sessions outside, and it completely changed. The coach was going right, you've got gym with whoever and they'd be like a, oh and the others be like right you, you half have got James and be like yes and I'd be like okay that's brilliant they might not take anything from these sessions but they're seeing psychology as something that's important and I've changed that perception of actually it's something that oh god it's something we've got to do to actually something that they kind of want to do um so definitely for sure that idea of fun and engagement ran through all my sessions even even up even up to, to 18s etc that's fantastic that because <laughs> because like you say people just hear the word psychology and then straight away they, they do have that perception certainly the like the, the older people um children are a little bit more um open-minded i suppose yeah and i think that's it i think it's just about because i know i'm from working with some 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 older adolescent teenagers 18 19 who'd who'd had psych experience not necessarily at Sunderland but wherever they were whatever club I've been in that they've had just I guess boring experiences stuff that hasn't engaged them and and they don't see the value of it because it's not something that they're really engaged in so for me if we can try and get that and start that early we're actually getting not just realizing the importance but understanding it isn't just sitting down and 
being told and then being told about certain emotions or whatever, but it's about fun. It's engaging. It can be engaging. It can be fun. And you know what? I can take something from it and I can put that into my football and I can, and relating it to football as well is really important for me. Like how can we really relate that to what's going on on the pitch at a weekend? And, and, and we found that really useful. And really a lot of the skills that you'll be teaching them are life skills as well, which is, which are going to help, uh, help them in their education. And as they, as they go out of, out of football and out of school. Exactly. Exactly. So I was very much within the sessions that we did. Um, there wouldn't, there'd always, I we always used to do them in blocks of work. So, say we take regulation or as a, as a block of work, a six week block of work, I'd always make sure within those blocks that there would be relation to how this might be a benefit is for you as a person, as an individual. So, yes, I know next week that you guys on the 16s, you've got your GCSEs next week. So, how might these skills that we're looking at here, how might they benefit you when, when you, when you enter that, 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 that um, that school hall? Cause I remember when I was a kid, I really suffered from somatic anxiety. My the butterflies in my stomach, the the, the, the nerves that I got were, were really quite detrimental. It, it meant that I couldn't actually think clearly. I wish I had some of those skills or I'd learned some of those skills that we'd been talking about. And I also remember vividly one kid who we used to te- teach, we used to talk about deep breathing. And we used to have fun doing like deep breathing exercises, taking a deep breath and just seeing what effect it has physiologically on you, on you as, a, as an individual. And I remember one kid, and it, it it lives with me, and it's someone I always mention. Is I remember him saying that because I I kind of made I'd set up a task where it brought about a little bit of anxiety and a bit of nervousness. I think it was about if you had the envelope, if you picked up an envelope and it had sing at the front, you had to get up in front of your teammates and sing. Now they never had to do that, but they didn't realise that at the time, and there was a bit of apprehension, a bit of nervousness within the room. You could tell it; they're all really excited, but also really like, oh god, I hope it's not me. And we took part in this deep breathing exercise. And I remember one kid saying, oh, it just feels like, yeah, I mean, my nerves haven't completely gone, but I've got four, I had four butterflies in my stomach before I did it. And now I've only got one. It feels like three have flown out. And I was just like, that is, like, that is a superb way of looking at it. And it was just a realisation of how effective some of these simple skills can be that actually could be a benefit wherever you take them. Um, and I do it. I, I, I take a few deep breaths every time I do a, a presentation or a workshop or a meeting or anything now because it's, it's that beneficial for me. So yeah, that they are they can be really useful if you get it right. They can be used in all walks of life. Mm. I like that. I might just pinch that little exercise off you at some point. <laughs> yeah, no, I'll, I'll talk you through it. I pinched it off, Greg. <laughs> Being ideas thief, I, I say I remember I, I was afraid someone else told me. Yeah, if you, if you if you see a good idea, take it. Maybe t- maybe reference it, but take it. Yeah, you can have it. Right. <laughs> and I know you've got a you've got a fascination or a, a, a real interest, maybe is is the word. In the 16 to 18 year old age group, uh, you, you talk about that being probably one of the most difficult mm. years, um, of a, of a young footballer's life. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's, yeah, as you said, so if you look at it, you've got under 16. So under 16s during that year, they are, they, they train, that might be, each club might be different. Um, but let's say they train three or four nights a week. Um, they have a game at the weekend and they might have day release. Um, suddenly when they're an under 18, they're in five days a week, uh, from the hours of nine in the morning to potentially four or five in the evening. It's a full-time job, um, pretty much. And within that there's education, there's gym work, there's your football, there's psychology, there's analysis, and it is so full on. And it's just about how can we, for me, it's about how can we best prepare these, um, these kids, these, these adolescents, these teenagers to, to basically go into the under 18s age group into a full time role. Um, and yeah, it's part, part of that's probably what's led me to my research, as you mentioned, in terms of looking at actually that transitional period and how coaches, parents, and athletes um, can, can interact and work together to, to make that transition as successful as, as possible. But, you know, at the same time, there's so many different kind of challenges that are going on at that time as well. So, um, you know, they're finishing their GCSEs at the age of under 16. So, not only are they feeling the pressure potentially whether they're going to get a scholarship or not, but they've got their exams. Um, they're heading into their A levels. They're developing as an adult, and you know they're having to make sacrifices as well. I guess that that those of of a similar age who aren't in academy football might not necessarily, you know, have. And and for me, there's just an increase in physical and mental workload that we need to make sure that we're preparing these 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 kids for. Um, so at Sundon, we tried to kind of address that and support that earlier on, and, and kind of identify those issues. So we used to, at 16s, probably around now, 
now time obviously with everything with COVID going on what these kind of timescales look like completely differs but we used to talk about the challenges with the players and, and the concerns they have around going into the under 18s the support that they might need um, the support that they already have that they can then tap into when, when, when they experience some of these challenges and kind of similar to what if planning I guess so so what if you're struggling to manage the workload from college who might you go and seek support from from the club um, what if your mates have got something planned for a Friday night um, you know that 16 year olds do but you've got a game the following day that kicks off at 11 and you know we won't come up with all the answers but what we might do it comes back to, to what we we're talking about right at the start if we can prepare them that one percent better and give them a few more little skills and mechanisms to to manage that transition then that could make a huge difference um and, you know we kind of we do similar kind of support sessions with with other age groups as well in terms of maybe tournament football prep like what happens if adversity hits how we manage this you know how might we we manage being two or three goals up etc so we, we do that kind of situation but for me that 16s to 18s is is key and for me it would even go to parents as well like getting them in terms of what are the challenges that you're going to experience because for parents they're going to see less of their children than they ever have done some kids stay in digs um some kids then start learning to drive at the age of 17. So actually the only time they probably saw them or some of the, the main times they had were those journeys in the car that were really important for some parents. But now, you know, their kids learning to drive, they become a bit more independent. So actually some of those parents are going to experience some real challenges as well. And as, as an organisation and as a sport, are we aware of those challenges and, and what support can we then offer parents as well to help manage that transition, which is which is a, a key, key thing for me as well. And I suppose something that, that always gets discussed is parents' expectation levels and and obviously where they actually sit at the various different age groups. I imagine that's important. Yeah, definitely. And expectations are huge with that under 18 year, because I think it's the first it's the first time where actually children aren't guaranteed they're not guaranteed players aren't guaranteed game time. Um so within the nines to sixteens, children you know, kids will always have game time. Under 18s, it becomes there's leagues, there's there's things to play for, rightly or wrongly. Some kids won't won't get match game time, and actually, our parents are aware of that. Are they aware of all these things that suddenly change when they go to under 18s? So, for me, that's important to communicate to, to parents and something maybe to address early on in in well, right at the start of the season is to is to understand, you know, what what everyone's expectations are for that season. So, not only coaches parents understanding coaches expectations but, but, but parents but coaches understanding parents expectations what do the parents expect from coaches etc in terms of communication um so yeah and, and and allowing all three to kind of talk about that is really key i'm just going to take you back again i suppose to the to the younger age groups it's, this is something that i've noticed quite a lot in my work where i've potentially been referred to for for one-to-one work um when a young footballer potentially around somewhere between sort of nine and 12 is very talented. So let's say they're a, they're an attacking player. Um, and they, when they're, when they're knocking around with a mix, they can take on players at will and what have you. And then all of a sudden thrust them into the academy environment or in a match situation. And they, they just go missing in the, they hide. They might, perhaps they might take the full back on the first time round and then, that fails, so the head goes down. What what advice would you offer to to parents and the, and who who got a child who's <laughs> who's in that situation? Yeah, it's a tough one, and as you say, it's something that that happens often. And I think it's it's it, the main thing is is just supporting your child through that moment in time, um, and it's also to trust trust the coaches in terms of what they're doing. A lot of these coaches are vastly experienced in managing those situations. Um, and I think that's key because suddenly if the child starts getting conflicting messages, and I think that's what you see sometimes as well is on the sideline, you might have that parent seeing the child struggling and trying to jump in and kind of save them and provide them with even more guidance and, and advice that might even be going against what the coach is saying. So it's really important that firstly for me is that both coach and parent are on the same line. They're both providing the same message to the player because otherwise that can cause even more confusion and, and, and become even more challenging for the player involved if, if that is the case. Um, and then it's just about, I guess it could be about setting process goals. So, so actually what are the little things that we can try and work on in each game? You're not necessarily going to go and score three goals a game, four goals a game, but actually what are the little things that we can work on? It might be your communication. It might be your leadership skills that we can focus on um, rather than focusing on the outcome and maybe scoring goals, creating assists, etc. cetera. Um, but it's certainly something that 
and I think it's something that again we talk about expectations that potentially we need to that clubs need to do an outline early on is is, is talk about those kind of challenges that players are going to have address them you know at times this isn't going to go well for you you know this is it's going to be challenging it's going to be really tough but what we can guarantee you is that if it does get challenging it does get tough and those moments do happen is that we're going to be here for you and we will support you as best we can um to, to get through those moments um and that includes involving the parents within that um and, and everyone working together and i guess this is why this research for me is so important because we need to realise how powerful and how impactful our parents are um, in terms of those kind of situations. And if we work with them rather than deal with them, which is that kind of rhetoric that we hear quite often within sport, then we'll see development in, in all aspects, really, not just in terms of performance. It's true. I suppose the, the difficulty is time often in, in various different sports, isn't it, actually to... If parents have got a busy lifestyle and they're working and likewise coaches, that, that can be one of the difficult things. Yeah, I think I guess the whole last year has kind of highlighted the the, the benefit of stuff like we're doing right now, talking over Zoom and, and, and creating time that, that actually we have got and potentially can do. And it only takes a five minute quick call, a quick chat after training or before training um, to kind of reinforce some of those key messages that we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. One of the things that you mentioned was process goals, and I know I'm I'm really big on using process goals. Would you mind just telling the listeners a little bit more about how that works and how you would perhaps support a footballer with that? Yeah, definitely. So, so when we talk about process goals and outcome goals. Outcome goals, I guess, are the end result. So, if we're looking at a, a take the player that you take the player that you maybe referred to earlier. Um, you know, playing a game and and then focusing on the outcome, which is, and, and with kids especially, it's a case of, oh, I want to win this game, I want to win this game, I'm going to score 10 goals, like that outcome of looking at the looking at the end goal rather than looking at the little things that are in between. And for me, process goals are about setting actually what are those goals that might allow us to achieve that outcome goal um, in the end. But even if we weren't going to achieve the outcome goal, we can still hit those process goals and see achievement and see development within ourselves. So those process goals might be for an individual, can you take on, three players during this game can you if you're an attacking winger actually don't worry about win or lose but your goal today is one of your goals might be just to see how many times you can take on the right back how many times can you be positive or or it might be you know actually they might one of their objectives might be to pass forward on more occasions or actually part of that process goal is yeah actually let's see how many times you can pass forward see how many times out of 50 what percentage can we get um and i think that's important as well we go back to um, parents and the impact that parents can have. Something that I might be going off topic a little bit here, but I guess this is the whole idea of podcasts. Um, was that I was listening to a podcast, another podcast, so I don't mean to advertise other podcasts on your podcast, but you've probably <laughs> heard of the eighty percent mental podcast that uh, that is available. And Camilla Knight was um, on this this week's one. And for those who, if you are really interested in parental engagement and involvement within sport, she is the expert. Um, within within sport in terms of parental involvement within sport and she was describing these kind of things how parents can get involved with this and and a lot of parents have trouble on the sidelines kind of managing their emotions they can get quite caught up in everything so if they see their child struggling and kind of it can bring about quite a high emotional state of you know disappointment sadness worry or anger but actually if you can get involved in terms of looking out for so if a child's objective is to pass forward like try and pass forward a few more times or more often in games could you be someone who looks out for that so actually could you start noting down how many times passing forward and and collate stats and have a job whilst that game's going on so actually your focus isn't necessarily on um the outcome and your son's thoughts uh, like emotions during the game and that they might have had a few mistakes but actually can you help kind of him address that process goal and give feedback for him and at the same time, that also means that both you and the coach are on the same page and player are on the same page because you've all seen and you all agreed to this kind of goal that they're looking to work towards. Um, so it means that, yeah, when the discussions and you give them feedback in the car, if you do on the way home, which I don't suggest is always the best thing to do, give it some space and time. But actually that provides a really good way of kind of assessing development, providing feedback, giving guidance, offering support and being on the same page as, as all of all of you on the same page together, if that makes sense, player, coach, and parent. Mm. So I, yeah, I, I love that. I think that's a fantastic idea. That is because, like you see, you're giving the parents some responsibility there, and it's it's something which is can only really be positive. 
Yeah, and I think you, you look at emotional contagion, which is where you know we, you know, we pass on our our own emotions and behaviours to others by the way we behave and the way we are, we are seen. And, and and I think players, for me, for young players especially, they'll look to the parent on the sideline and see, oh, how are they doing? Like, what what are they showing? A lot more emotions are they showing? And that that will transfer over. And you know, it's important that you know parents are displaying the behaviours that you want your child to display. It's a great way of doing it. It's, it takes your focus away from. From, from the outcome and, and focusing on actually how how do we want to what is my son's or daughter's um, development looking like and how can I support them yeah very much so because like if you think about it from a child's perspective if your parents are on the side of the pitch there and maybe they're on their phone um, then you're thinking well are they really interested <laughs> if, they're, if they're really animated and shouting instructions all the time you, you're going to be embarrassed <laughs> exactly. yeah in terms of coaches, uh, part of the role of a sports psychologist is naturally to try and upskill coaches. What are the common areas that you've gone on to provide support? Yeah, so for me, that's something that's probably in my my own practice, my own applied work has kind of been an area that I feel that I probably developed most in in terms of when I first started, I always found it quite difficult. Um, I think it's, it's not a subject really, but because of my age and inexperience around clubs, I found it quite difficult to engage with coaches. But I think now I've been involved in you know, academy football for, for some time. I feel like I've got a good experience and good knowledge around these kind of areas. I feel a bit more confident in doing that. And I think it's all depended on which club I've kind of been involved in. So different clubs work in different ways. And for me, it's really important to try and help coaches um, understand what key psychological characteristics are important when looking to develop when, when looking at developing players that they're, they're kind of working with and what's worked well for me I've found it is not necessarily going in as the expert and saying you should be looking at this we'll be looking at that um, but actually understanding from them what it is that they feel is important to develop within their players so that's giving the coaches some freedom of choice and, and autonomy in, in these decisions that they're making and, and then we'll try and look to marry this in with some of the literature that, that that's out there so we can look at the five c's framework that's that's been banded about you can look at pcbs etc um and then dependent upon what they feel is important it's about then educating educating them and using my knowledge to help educate them on the aspects so it might be well, what does that look like on a good or bad day so you know when a player is showing good emotional control what might that look like on a good day what might that look like on a bad day kind of addressing and kind of outlining what those behaviors look like um you know, how might we know when, when that child's hitting the sweet spot and, and actually they're really, you know, regulating those emotions, et cetera. Um, and for me, it's allowing coaches, for me, working with coaches, also allowing them to to understand what's going on with a child at a particular moment in time, for me, is really important. Um, and that's alongside not just me and coach, that's that's alongside the MDT as well. And, and that's where, when you're lucky enough to work in an academy, you know, you've got you've got other people around you that can help support you, and you can gain information of. And for me, everyone, it's really important that you know everyone's perspective is is heard within those meetings, and and and, and those meetings you get a real understanding of, of what's going on um, with that individual in question. So, you know, you might get um, a sports scientists discuss um, peak high velocity and their growth related issues. The physio might then be able to discuss how that might be impacting the body. You might then have the education manager come in and say, you know, there's these issues with school and that then helps the coach and provides them with a better understanding of what's going on with that child um, and will probably be able to better facilitate their development. And for me, as a sports psych, working with coaches, it, sometimes it's about just holding that space um, and gaining as much information as you know possibly can to, to facilitate that coach and allow them to have a better understanding of the individual at that moment in time and what their current needs are. Um, and then you've also got times where you know you might be out with, with the coach. And, and, and to be fair, actually, for me, what was really good at Sunderland was the coaches really got involved with the sports psych sessions as well. When I felt that it was it was necessary to or, or or would have been beneficial, so they got involved with some of the sessions. And what that did was then coaches can relate when when they're out on the pitch, when they're out training, and there's games, etc., and doing half time team talks. They could then relate those moments back to what we'd learned or picked up on within the psych workshop or whatever we've been doing. And that's works that that works really well. Um, and, and coaches then. They, they start enjoying sports psychology within those sessions as well. So so they're more inclined to engage with it. So there's been different ways of, of trying to get coaches involved um, through giving them autonomy in terms of what it is that they want to look at um, to include them within some of the sessions that we've been doing. I'm sure you mentioned a little bit earlier as well about doing some stuff on the pitch. Is that right? Yeah, well, it might just be, yeah. So we also, with coaches, we, we used to do um, 
during game days and stuff, just check in with coaches at certain moments in time. So it might be every 15, 20 minutes to kind of allow them to have a step back, take a breather, see the whole picture rather than, because coaches can get quite, you know, they can get quite caught up in games. They probably say that they don't, but you, they do. Um, so again, it's about, you know, allowing them and providing them that space to reflect on what's gone on. Um, so it might be a five minute chat before the half time talk to then actually so when they go into that half time talk they've got a clearer idea of what they what it is what it is that they want to say um, when they're going to say it how they're going to say it etc so supporting them with that it can be beneficial as well Brilliant you've shared some fascinating insights there into academy football so I really appreciate that I think, I think it just shows that you know it is I think some people sometimes have a perception that sports psychology and football is isn't going anywhere and it's not progressing sometimes we we can get a little bit frustrated but it is um it really is i think from when i first started six seven years ago the development of the the, the discipline is, is massively improved um within within academy football within the clubs that i've been in anyway yeah and it goes to show like by the fact that we've talked here for half an hour and we could probably talk for hours about this exactly. <laughs> how much how much involvement um a sports psychologist can actually have and how, how much influence Definitely, definitely, completely agree. And on the theme of influence, I wondered who would you say has been the biggest influence on your career to date and why? So, uh, yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I've, we've talked before, these are questions that have been asked on uh, me numerous times on my podcast and, and just every now and again. And, and for me, it's quite cheesy. It's no one special, but well, it's, of course, it's someone special. Um, but it's not the first time I've been asked that question. I'd say, I'd, I'd say my parents, and, and I say that because it's something that I've thought about whilst I've been doing my training and you kind of think about why, why have you gone down this route? What is it that's made you go into this industry? And for me, you know, both my parents worked in quite pastoral roles. So my mum was a teacher. Um, she taught me at times, which was quite embarrassing. Um, and my dad was a bishop and, you know, both roles for me are all about building relationships and supporting others. Um, so for example, I can remember my dad having an open door, late at night to those who needed his support and I can vividly remember him like walk, like working through some pretty tough situations with some of the parishioners that would, that would come from the church and you know he'd, he'd listen intently to what they had to say and there were skills that I'd be like how do you have the patience to do that um I like, listened so intently for such long periods of time and you know he, he, he always said he didn't necessarily always provide an answer but but whenever people left his office, you kind of got that sense that they've got a better outlook on their life and a better outlook on the, the, the situation, the challenges that they're going through now and what they did when they first walked through his door. And, and, and yeah, that, that, that was all for me about him just being there, supporting, listening and being a space to, to support people. Um, and then I guess from a professional sense, it'd be, it'd be harsh for me not to say Greg. Um, and, and I say that because, you know, Greg, not many others do. He kind of keeps himself to himself, but he's for those that have worked with him and, and those who've been supported by him definitely know who he is. And, and he's a great practitioner who's kind of taught me a lot about what being a good sports psychology, uh, being a good sports psychologist is, is, is about. Um, and I always remember someone saying actually a quote, a good sports psychologist asks good questions. And it always, whenever I think of that, I always think of Greg because whenever I was in meetings with him, he'd always ask good questions, tough questions but good ones that, that always got people thinking. So I'd say, yeah, from a personal and professional sense, I'd say those those, those people. They relate quite nicely together, actually, the, the two there, because when you're talking about your dad there, often that is our job, isn't it, to, to just to allow space and to listen, but coupled with what you mentioned there with Greg, asking really good and potentially challenging questions, because often people do have the answers themselves. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Can you put it better? Okay, so for the listeners, uh, what would you say are the three key takeaways from our conversation? Yeah, I'm not so sure about three. I mean, I'm hoping that within the, the, the discussion that we've had, there's takeaways in there, and I don't want to repeat myself in terms of some of those, but I'm hoping that within some of those, some of the discussion that we've had, there's some practical insights into how you might better support your child, how you might support coaches if you're a sports psych or even just a general practitioner. Um, and hopefully what we might look at doing when we're looking at kids who are transitioning from one age group to another and how we might support that proactively rather than reactively. Because I think a lot of the time we'll go, oh, this person hasn't adjusted well enough. What can we do? Actually, let's look at that early, do early doors and go, well, what challenges might this person experience? Can we equip them with the necessary support and resources that they might need? Um, so I guess those are key takeaways. But for me, a key takeaway, and it's something that I always mention, is, is the idea of relationships. 
for me being a sports psychologist and just in general, you know, humans have a, have a need for, for, for interpersonal relations. They love, they thrive on relationships. Um, and nothing's bigger, nothing's a bigger determinant of our well-being and, and, and quality of experience in whatever we're doing than the, the connections that we have with the people around us. So for me, it's really important that the people that we're working with, we, we build those strong relationships with. And the basis of that for me is about listening. So for parents who are looking to support their child, just provide that space and listen for me. It's the most important one because sometimes I just don't want an answer. They just want to talk to someone about the troubles and challenges that they're having. So be that space and, 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 and listen intently to what they've got to say and offer support and guidance if you deem it necessary. Um, for me, that's a massive one. I'm, I'm not going to give you free because I feel there's loads in there. Um, and we could end up talking for ages. But for me, yeah, the importance of building relationships is a massive takeaway for me in, in the work that we do within sport um, with all the stakeholders that we, we, we interact with. Two sounds a good number in this case. as well. Yeah, two... To really insightful uh, from fantastic answers there so yeah a big thank you and again a big thank you for your time whereabouts can the listeners uh, find you if they want to ask any questions or connect with you yeah the best thing for me is probably probably twitter um and that's at james morris sp sp for sports psychologist it was the most original thing i could come up with so yeah i mean I, yeah i mean if you want to email me my, my email is j.morris at wlv.ac.uk more than happy to answer any questions so so yeah get in touch if you feel the need to excellent i'll put those details in the show notes uh, when the podcast's released and like i say again really appreciate your time a big thank you james no problem davis thanks very much i don't know about you but i really enjoyed that episode the conversation flowed nicely in fact we could quite easily be still here now or in a couple of hours time but it did have to end at some point As I mentioned earlier, it's a subject I'm really, really passionate about, is seeing youngsters get the best treatment and get the most from their talent. It's so important that their personal needs are taken care of, they're treated like human beings, their mental health is considered into the mix too. I'm really, really passionate about this. And on the topic of mental health, you can expect next week that Mental health will be discussed on this podcast on more than one occasion. Yep, next week will be the 50th episode of Demystifying Mental Toughness. And because of that, because it's a landmark moment in this podcast, I've decided to do something a little bit special. And what you're going to find is, during the daytime on Friday the 30th of April, If you keep an eye out on my social media channels, you're going to see that I'll be interviewing a range of guests, some who've appeared on the show before, some that will appear in the future, about a variety of topics. Ultimately, my aim is to dispel the myth around mental toughness, and that's what I'm going to be trying to do that particular day. And then secondly, for the podcast, what I'm going to be doing from Friday the 30th of April all the way through till Monday the 11th of May, I've got an audacious plan. On every single one of those days, a new episode of Demystifying Mental Toughness will come out. And this is going to be a little bit different, certainly in terms of the content, and I'm quite excited by that. So I'm going to leave a little bit of anticipation there and just leave it at that for now. You're going to find out more when you tune in next Friday to Demystifying Mental Toughness. In the meantime, have a great week. I'd like to give a big thanks to today's sponsors, Functional Intelligent Training, who are a sports injury clinic located in Gosford, near Newcastle-upon-Tyne, and specialise in athlete development, nurturing future champions, strength and conditioning support, and excellent rehabilitation services. Thank you for listening to Demystifying Mental Toughness today. To sign up for tips and advice to help you be the best that you can be, go to www.sport-excellence.co.uk and sign up to the Mental Edge newsletter.